Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> yes, everyone make sure they get, turn their cell phones off. We'll, uh, we'll start. My name is Drew Adair. I'm with the law firm of Deasy Mahoney and Valentini. Uh, I am an attorney that specializes in civil rights law, and I particularly specialize in municipal defense. What that means is I represent uh, cities, towns, counties, boroughs, etc. I, I do some work for the city of Reading as well as uh, public officials, elected and appointed, and people like yourselves who get paid a paycheck for a living. Um, the areas that we're going to talk about today is an area that I have a lot of experience in defending, so hopefully the information that we're going to give you is something that you can take and you can put to use in your, your own practice and your own jobs. Um, the real goal what we're doing today is to help you perform your jobs a little bit more efficiently, a little bit more effectively, and hopefully we're going to minimize the possibility that you get sued down the line. In addition to myself, we're going to be joined by Captain Drexler and Sergeant Montero of the City of Reading Police Department, who are both excellent teachers, they're excellent instructors, we've done this program with them in the past. Um, after my presentation is, is on, we're, Captain Drexler is going to talk to you about uh, issues with regard to obtaining and enforcing search warrants and then Sergeant Montero is going to finish up the presentation talking about the art and believe me it is an art of writing citations. Something that you think you may know everything about but I guarantee you he's going to have some angles that you haven't considered. Because this is a training videotape I'm going to ask that you hold all your questions to, you, to the end. At that point what we're going to do is uh, you know, I'll be happy to answer or try to answer as many questions as you may have. We'll stay here as long as, as you want. Um, but with that said, let me start out by discussing some practical considerations. Now, these are some practical considerations. What I'm telling you, this may be obvious to you. In fact, I think it's obvious to a lot of people, but sometimes it's worth stating the obvious because it's going to help you do your job. And the first most important goal of any kind of code enforcement job uh, is basically that voluntary compliance is much more effective than resorting to litigation. And when I say litigation, I mean an, an enforcement action, where you guys have to actually go and apply for a um, citation based upon somebody's failure to abate a problem, or whatever it may be. You know, the issues that we're discussing don't just have to do with code enforcement themselves, they also have to do with your fire marshals, Anybody who goes and conducts inspections on properties, um, the bottom line is if you can encourage members of the public to voluntarily either let you perform an inspection or voluntarily abate a problem, it's, it's just going to save you a lot of time. So it's certainly going to save you a lot of aggravation, and that is our goal. So everything we do is, is aimed towards voluntary compliance. The first sort of corollary to the voluntary compliance, um, uh, I guess, goal is that your attitude and your appearance are very important and yes, they do count. You want to present yourselves as polite but professional. And I understand that that's not always easy to do. Uh, you're going out there, there are a lot of members of the public that may not be all that happy to see you or all that happy to, to deal with you. Uh, but at all times, it is important for you to look presentable, to be clearly identified as code enforcement officers, um, and to treat the people that you're, you're coming into contact with with the utmost of respect. Now, at the same time, you don't need to be a pushover for them. I mean, certainly you don't have to take any grief from somebody, but rather than lashing out and becoming angry, the best way is just to deal with it in a professional, polite manner. The Play it cool is sort of my motto. People get in your face. I understand that there are people out there, members of the public, who may be videotaping you, people who may be trying to record you. There are certainly members of the public who are, may try to bait you into losing your, losing your cool. Um, and then there's a lot of members of the public, in fact, probably the vast majority of the public, that really has no agenda other than just getting through the inspection or whatever reason they're dealing with you. But when these people are trying to bait you, it's even more important that you resort back to a calm, cool, and collected uh, manner of dealing with them, especially if you're on videotape, because I guarantee you those videotapes are going to show up on the internet. They're going to show up if there's a lawsuit filed. They may very well show up in your enforcement action if you actually file uh, some sort of a, if you serve them with a uh, citation and they challenge that. So at all times, keep your cool. 
one of the la or the last two, um, I guess, goals as they were, be consistent and do not retaliate, they go hand in hand. Consistency is what we're striving for. And this is across the board. You have to consistently evaluate each property that you come in contact with. But it's also helpful if different members of code enforcement similarly are consistent in their enforcement. Now, I know as a practical matter, you go out to a property, you may see 50 violations. But you know what? 20 of them may be they are just technical violations. You don't care about it. You're not going to enforce it. What I'm suggesting to you is not that you need to enforce the regulations or the rules to the letter of the law each and every time. I mean, that's a decision that you and the city make as um, that's a policy decision. But what I am suggesting you need to do, you need to be consistent with your application. And that goes hand in hand with retaliation. Somebody's really making you angry. It's important that you don't come and grade them on a higher scale than you might grade somebody else. So, you know, if the same 50 violations, you're only going to enforce 30 of them against your normal average person who's complying with your requests. You're not going to enforce all 50 against somebody who's giving you a hard time. Consistency is, is in essence, what beats a retaliation claim. This probably goes without saying, but I'm going to say it nonetheless because I think it's important. Documenting your investigation. Now, you guys go out, and I'm not sure how many uh, inspections you might do on a week, but I'm sure that it's an awful lot of them. And it's every week, out of the year, every month, you're doing more and more. It's difficult to remember something a few weeks down the line. It makes it difficult for you if you have to pursue an enforcement action to remember what it is, what you saw, who you dealt with in a particular uh, property. But I guarantee you that if you have to deal with me because you've been sued, it's going to be that much more difficult. The statute of limitations for a civil rights lawsuit is typically two years. And the way these things work, plaintiff's lawyers wait those two years. So it's probably going to be about two and a quarter years until you realize you've been sued. And I guarantee you that two and a quarter years after you've inspected a property, you are not going to remember very much about it. That's why documenting your investigation is extremely important. Keep clear notes. If anything stands out at you during an investigation, just jot it down. It doesn't have to make sense to anybody other than you. It just has to make sense to you. I don't have to be able to read it. I'll ask you what it means. If you take photographs, and I'm not sure if you take visual or video or glossy photos, if they're video photos, name the photograph something descriptive so you know what they refer to, if they're glossy right on the back, because I guarantee you that a picture of peeling paint inside of a house looks like a picture of peeling paint outside of the house, and a third floor hallway looks like a second floor hallway, and while you may remember what it is two weeks from now, you sure are not going to remember about what it is two years from now. So identify your photographs. Keep a journal or a log. Um, one of the complaints that I hear, I hear that you guys are typically working with uh, the same property owner. You're cutting them a lot of slack. You know, yeah, well, there was this violation. I said, hey, listen, you know what? Fix it by a week from now, and I'll come back. A week from now, it says, well, you know, contractor wouldn't come back. Say, okay, I'll give you another two weeks. You come back two weeks, well, I had a contractor, but he didn't have insurance, so I had to get somebody else. Next thing you know, three months has passed. You've been dealing with this guy on a regular basis. If you don't have some kind of a record of the number of times that you've dealt with him, you're really losing a lot of information. And that becomes important, particularly if you file, if you, you serve him with a citation, if he challenges the citation, you go in front of a DJ, you go in front of the DJ and say, listen, you know, Judge, I talked to this guy, one, one, two, three, seven times. And he kept telling me he was going to fix it. You know, and at the end of that time, he still didn't fix it. It's a much more powerful case. It lets you show how you are being reasonable and how you're trying to work with somebody. Um, so it's very helpful. Obviously, and I think you guys do a good job at this, get the names of your witnesses and your complainants. You want to make sure you get their names, you get their home addresses, you get their cell phone numbers, you get their home phone numbers, because witnesses, as you know, particularly in the city of Reading, disappear pretty quickly. You'll never see them again. Um, if you do get somebody, a witness that cooperates with you, 
Sometimes you get that neighbor that wants to uh, give you all kinds of information. Encourage them to keep a log. Encourage them to keep a journal. You have no idea how, number one, important that makes them feel. But number two, they're going to have the same memory problems that you're going to have. And this is the kind of thing that will definitely help you if down the line you're in court and you're, you're trying to remember what happened or your witness is trying to remember what happened. All right. I mentioned earlier that I'm aware that there are members of the public that are trying to videotape you guys, and I understand that's, that's disturbing. Um, it's bo at least it's bothering. Unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that the public does have a right to videotape you. you. You folks are public servants. What you're doing within the course and scope of your employment is of concern to the public, even though you think they really is no reason they should care about it. It is something where videotaping of you is permitted. Now that is not to say that they've got a right to videotape you off duty. When you're off duty, you're a private citizen. You've got as much right to your own privacy as anyone else does. So that's an important distinction. If you are being videotaped, my recommendation obviously is to act professional, don't lose your cool, all the things that we talked about earlier. Remember, these videotapes do have a way to come back to haunt people, so make sure that whatever you you show on the videotape reflects a someone who's in charge of the situation, somebody who's polite, somebody who's firm. Next question is sound recording. They can take your video, your video recording, can they record your voice? Now there's a common misconception out there that uh, people can't record your voice without your consent. Well, Pennsylvania has got one of the strongest wiretapping laws in the country. But I will tell you that it all comes down to whether you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your conversation. And as I mentioned to you a minute ago, you're public servants. Um, you're fulfilling your job as public servants. You're in their house performing inspections as public servants. The answer is that you probably do not have an expectation of, or a reasonable expectation of privacy in your own voice. So the answer is that people probably do have a right to record your voice. Now. Just because people have a right to do this, to record your video, to record your sound, doesn't mean that you have no recourse whatsoever at all. One of the things that you can do is if somebody is recording your voice and you're not happy, ask them to stop it in a polite but, but firm manner. As long as you're not performing any kind of a job that's mandatory, there's no reason that you have to talk to them right at that time. So, you know, here's a great example. Somebody comes in, you're working, for whatever reason, you're behind the desk in codes, somebody's got a question for you. Just a, you know, just general question. Where's the bathroom? They've got a video camera in your face and they're recording your, your voice. You don't have to tell them where the bathroom is. So you can say, well, ma'am, I'd be happy to answer your question if you'd please turn off the sound or please turn off the video. It's a discretionary job. On the other hand, somebody comes in and they want to talk to you about their particular um, grievance, and it is within the scope of your job, there you may have a much more difficult time telling them that you want them to turn off the sound because one way or another you have to deal with that person. That is part of your job responsibility, or at least part of your core responsibility. So in order to fulfill your, your role as a public servant, um, you can ask them to turn it off, but if they don't, you may have no recourse. I, th I think that's a little bit of, of common sense, um, and I understand there may be people that are doing that now, but I'm here to tell you that, unfortunately, they do have that right to, um, to make those recordings. Now, on this note, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn our attention to some constitutional law, some issues of constitutional law that affect you as code enforcement officers. We're here today to discuss constitutional issues in code enforcement. This is a very important topic. This is an important topic because you're, you are public servants, you deal with members of the public on a regular basis, and both the United States and the Pennsylvania Constitution place certain limits on what you can and cannot do. If you fall afoul of those limits, you run the risk, as you're aware, of having a civil rights lawsuit filed against you or perhaps losing your, your, um, your enforcement action if you filed a uh, citation against somebody. The first thing that you have to understand 
is that because we're dealing with constitutional issues, the question is, are these criminal or are these civil issues? And the answer is it's a little bit of both. Most of the ordinances that you folks enforce are municipal civil ordinances. The people you're dealing with are not criminals. It's not across the board, but for the most part, for the most part they are not criminals. That being said, these laws are enforced through the rules of criminal procedure, which gives these people who are not criminals all of the benefits and all of the advantages as if they were criminal defendants um, in the court of law. That's where the Constitution comes into play. The most important amendment that deals with searches and seizures, well, actually the only amendment that deals with searches and seizures, the most important amendment for you to be aware of is the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution. And the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. And basically, if somebody has a reasonable expectation of privacy in their property, then they have a right to ask you not to come onto your property unless you have a search warrant that's based upon probable cause. So that's what we're gonna talk about mostly today. Number one, do you have to have a search warrant? Number two, what is probable cause and when do you have it? First of all, consequences of violating somebody's constitutional rights. You go and you conduct an unlawful search, search without consent or without privilege, or a seizure. You take something out of their property that's unlawfully taken because you don't have probable cause or a search warrant. What are the consequences? The easiest one is if you file, you serve them with a citation, they challenge the citation, you're in front of a district justice or a summary appeal down the line, what's gonna happen is they're gonna challenge the way you obtained that evidence and they're gonna ask that evidence be excluded. If you did violate their constitutional rights, chances are that evidence is gonna be excluded, number one, and that is gonna result in you losing your enforcement action. Now, that's, you know, that's a job hazard. That's something that you guys do on a regular basis. There's another consequence which should probably hit a little bit closer to home with you. And that is a violation of somebody's civil rights can lead to a civil rights lawsuit. And I will tell you that somebody has the right to a lawsuit, even if they didn't suffer any actual damages, they can still file a lawsuit against you because the violation of a civil right in and of itself is considered a damage. Now what can happen? These civil right lawsuits typically have claims for punitive damages. And while the city will defend you and will defend itself if there's a civil rights lawsuit, you have some personal exposure. And you have personal exposure for punitive damages. Because in Pennsylvania, you cannot insure for punitive damages against yourself. And in all of these lawsuits, in, not, in every single lawsuit that I've dealt with, there's a punitive damages claim. Now, proving punitive damages can be difficult, but it's something you have to worry about. It's your, it's your house, it's your car, it's your income. Um, I'm hoping, I'm, what I'm trying to do is get your attention because this is something to be concerned with. Now, in a civil rights lawsuit, you should be aware that there's liability not just if you personally violate somebody's civil rights, but if you give somebody, if you intentionally do something that causes someone else to violate a citizen's civil rights. Let me give you an example. You knowingly and intentionally tell another code officer that there's a violation in somebody's house. That other code officer, based upon your information, then goes and, and has an unlawful entry onto that person's property. Not only, well, the, the code officer who responded, as long as they're pure of mind, probably doesn't have anything to worry about, but you, by passing off that false information, knowingly false information, now all of a sudden you have potential exposure. Same thing applies with conspiracy. A bunch of you get together. Well, I don't like um, Mr. X because Mr. X is a big pain in my neck. Well, let's get him. You figure out a way, a plan, how you're gonna get together and, and get back at Mr. X, you're gonna go and you're gonna have a uh, um, unauthorized search of his rental property or something like that. Even if none of you are involved with actually going onto his property and inspecting his property unlawfully, the fact that you conspired to do it can give rise to civil rights liability. And as I mentioned before, in civil rights cases, you always have to worry about punitive damages. So this can come back and haunt you personally.
the bottom line, everything that I'm telling you today is for you to understand what the contours of these rights are so you know where not to violate them. I mean, that's sort of our goal, keep you guys out of trouble and also help you do your job a little better. Well, I mentioned a moment ago that the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, not every search and seizure is unreasonable and not every entry onto somebody's property is unauthorized. There are certain exceptions that apply. Certain times you don't need a search warrant. I've broken them down into four categories. First of all, this category where the Fourth Amendment just doesn't apply. Somebody has an unreasonable expectation of privacy. And we're going to get into all these in a moment. Second of all, the most important one and the easiest one is consent. Somebody is giving you consent to go onto their property. That's really our goal. I mean, that goes, goes along with voluntary compliance. You have consent to go onto the property. You don't need a search warrant. Third, exigent circumstances. I mean, that has to do with fire. I think you guys know what that is, but we'll talk about that as well. And then finally, there's the plain view doctrine, which uh, we'll discuss briefly at the end. First one, does the Fourth Amendment apply because somebody has or does not have a reasonable expectation of privacy? This depends on the individual circumstances in each and every case. There is no hard and fast rule that I can give you when the Fourth Amendment will or will not apply. All I can give you are certain examples to help you understand it. To determine if someone has a reasonable expectation of privacy, it's a two-pronged test. Number one, has the individual manifested a subjective expectation of privacy in the object of the challenge search? In other words, does the person really believe that this place is or is not private? You know, you believe your house is a private place, but do you believe that a crowded subway station is a private place? It's a question of whether it's, it's a true belief by the individual. And then number two, sure, you may have a real expectation of privacy, but is society willing to recognize that as reasonable. And you know, a great example of this is an abandoned building. Now you guys have abandoned buildings in the city all the, and, and you see this all the time. Is an abandoned building, does the owner of that property have a reasonable expectation of privacy? Well the answer is probably I don't know, but let me give you some facts. There's a case where basically property owner had a property, was out of the picture, hadn't been there in five years, um, the, the property wasn't boarded up, had vandals coming in and out of it, had drug users going in and out of it. Place is falling down, it's open, there's a hole in the roof, rain's coming in. Court ruled that in that case the person had abandoned that property, therefore they had no reasonable expectation that that property would be private, and when code enforcement went in there, guess what? No violation of their civil rights. Now, I contrast that with another case, and this is a case of Sherson versus Kolish, and in Sherson versus Kolish, you had a situation where a woman and her husband owned a house. They separated, they ultimately divorced. Woman moves out of the area, she's no longer around, it's too far to come to the house, she's got no reason to go to the house. She doesn't, you know, doesn't check up on it. Her name's still on the title though. Meanwhile, husband moves out of the, the scene as well. So now we don't have husband or wife living in the house. House catches on fire. Woman somehow finds out about the fire. She sends some people in there through her insurance company to board it up. So now you have a boarded up house. But that's about all that she does. You know, she, she just basically does, basically secures it. So you don't have a problem with people coming in and out. But that's about it. In this particular case, the fire marshal, for one reason or another, waits about 11 months, comes back, and then he decides that he's going to conduct his inspection into what caused the fire. Goes in there says, wow, this place has fallen down, talks to the uh, municipal solicitor, says, we got to do something. Solicitor says, tell you what, we'll send a letter. They send a letter, and they send that letter back, you know, doesn't find its way to the wife, goes back to the husband, goes back to the address where the falling down property is, but doesn't make it to the wife. They end up tearing the house down. The question is, was the fire marshal's entry into that place 11 months after the fire, was that an unlawful search and seizure? Well, first of all, there was no exigent circumstance. You know, there's no reason that he had to go in there 11 months after the fact. He had all that time where he did nothing. So they said, there's no exigent circumstance here. But he also found that the woman had not abandoned the house. She had done at least the minimum of securing it by throwing up um, plywood over the doors and the windows. 
And, you know, while she wasn't there on a regular basis, she at least ex manifested an intent to um, continue to possess ownership of the house. Therefore, she still had a reasonable expectation of privacy. So, giving you two contrasting views there, what's the lesson to learn from this? The lesson is that you folks can't assume anything. When, if you have any doubt as to whether someone has a reasonable expectation of privacy or not, the easiest and the safest thing for you to do is to go get a search warrant. It's not very difficult, it's not very hard to do, and that way you're safe, you don't get sued, um, protects your interests and protects the interests of the citizens that you come in contact with. Talking about reasonable expectations of privacy, the courts have different standards, same tests, but different standards depending upon where you're located. Your highest expectation of privacy is in your own house, your residence. You've heard the expression, a man's home is his castle. Well, the courts take that to heart. That is ultimately the highest um, expectation of privacy that you have in your own house. Moving outside of the house a little bit, you have an area called the curtilage. And the curtilage is the little bit of area around the house. Um, sometimes it's set off with a fence, sometimes it's not. Great example here in Reading, you've got um, row houses behind the row houses. There's typically a little yard, sometimes there's a detached garage behind it. That would be within the curtilage. Those areas, there's a very, very high expectation of privacy. Not quite as high as in the residence itself, but it's almost as high. And so there's an expectation of privacy there. That being said, if you can see into those curtilage areas from the public street, there's no expectation of privacy for that which is in plain view. This case, uh, California versus uh, Sorolo, was a case where in a suburban situation, so we're you know, maybe a little divorced in the city of Reading, but it's got a great fact pattern. You've got a person who owns a suburban property. They put up a six-foot fence. Behind that, they put up a 10-foot fence you know, pretty big piece of land, but it's immediately around the house. Inside of that 10-foot fence, they end up planting, you know, a quarter acre of marijuana. Can't see it from the street. But they've got their privacy fences. You know, anybody passing on the street doesn't know what's going on behind. The police get a tip. Hey, there's marijuana going on. They get an airplane, fly over, 1,000 feet, real low, real slow, naked eye. They can see marijuana. They take a 35-millimeter picture, snap picture of marijuana. So this is a criminal case, obviously doesn't apply to you, but these laws still are applicable. It's the same, same rules. Defendant goes, uh, you know, prosecuting him for, for basically harvesting marijuana, possession with intent, intent to distribute, all of that. The uh, defendant said, I had an expectation of privacy. I was growing this marijuana in the privacy of the curtilage surrounding my house. In fact, you know that I expected that it would remain private because I put up a six foot and a 10 foot fence. The US Supreme Court said, that's a ridiculous argument. Said, the bottom line, if the police had passed by on the roof of a double decker bus and looked into your property, they could have seen it. If there was a knot hole in your fence, they could have seen it. If they were on top of another building, they could have seen it. The fact that the police used an airplane to fly over is of no importance. What's the moral of this story? This goes to the expectation of privacy. Yes, there, the person did have a subjective belief that this property was private and that whatever he did, in this case grow pot, would not be seen by the outside world. But it wasn't a reasonable expectation because number one, it's out in the open. Number two, it could have been seen by anybody, and in fact, it was seen by, by an airplane. This, as I said, while that's a, that case involves criminal sanctions, it's the same application here. Somebody has a fence, you're passing by on a public street, but there's slats between the fence. If you can see in there and see a code violation from the street, it's plain view. You can see it. Now, that doesn't give you the right to go in there and investigate, but it might give you the right to then go apply for a search warrant. So reasonable expectation of privacy, the society recognizes it as reasonable. Commercial property. Is there a reasonable expectation of privacy in a commercial, commercial property? The answer is, there is. Owners of commercial property do have an expectation of privacy, but it's not as high as in the residence. And in fact, not only is it not as high, where you've got commercial property that has got both public and private portions of it, 
there is a very low expectation of privacy in the public portion, and there's a higher expectation in the private portion. So, for example, in the case of um, Commonwealth versus Feinigal, a, uh, there were photographs that were taken of a, an auto garage back into the garage right from the door frame, from the public entrance, take the pictures right back there. That was viewed from the public area. Maybe another example that, that might apply to you folks um, would be a, a, a restaurant. You know, you walk into a restaurant, the dining area is open to the public, you're members of the public. That area, there's a low expectation of privacy, but members of the public are not allowed back into the kitchen. So you can't just go back into the kitchen area to conduct any kind of an inspection without probable cause, a search warrant, or consent, or some other ex, um, exception to the Fourth Amendment. Additionally, there are certain commercial enterprises that are considered closely regulated businesses, um, and, and I'm not going to get into those, other than to say that closely regulated businesses, there's an expectation that they're always going to be inspected. These are typically uh, businesses that involve the sale of liquor, firearms, mining operations, you know, uh, anything that's, that's highly regulated. The answer is, if you're doing an inspection on one of them, you've already, you already know which ordinances are letting you do the inspection without a search warrant. Um, you should never make an assumption. If you don't know those ordinances, you should never assume that you've got a right to enter the property. Again, the default recommendation is go seek a search warrant. It's just a lot easier, or seek consent. So, in summary, if there's no reasonable expectation of privacy, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply, you don't need a search warrant. However, there is a reasonable expectation of privacy. Next question is, is there another exception that gets you around the search warrant requirement? And now we come to consent. And consent is a little tricky, but again, this is the easiest and most effective way to get access to, prop to a property. If somebody will consent to let you do an inspection, my first recommendation to you, I don't know whether the city of Reading right now is using a, um, a form, a document. If someone gives you consent, you ask someone to sign off on it. It's not a requirement that you do that, but if you do have somebody, if they've given you consent to a search, if you have them sign off on it, what it does is it protects your neck down the line if you're ever sued and somebody said, I didn't give you consent. If you can pull out a piece of paper and said, well, I've got your signature right here, it's helpful. Um, again, not a requirement, just a suggestion. Consent to let you onto the property has to be voluntary, and it's all, that's tested based upon the totality of the circumstances. Whether consent is voluntary, courts look to the setting in which the consent was given, the party's verbal and nonverbal actions, as well as the age, intelligence, and educational background of the person that gives you consent. So if you come to my house to perform an inspection, and my six-year-old daughter says, go ahead, daddy says it's cool, Something should, uh, a bell should go off on your head and say, I don't know, she's a pretty smart six-year-old, but I don't know if I can trust her on this one. Um, usually this isn't an issue where you, you know who the property owner is or the tenant or something, you ask for consent, you don't have a problem, but there are situations where maybe more than one person can give you consent or more than one person's consent is needed. And that is the concept of common authority. Uh, where there is common authority, either party can give you consent to perform an inspection or a search or whatever you want to call it. Um, but common, thor common authority doesn't depend on property law, so you don't have to be a lawyer to know whether there's common authority. It depends on the mutual use of the property by persons who generally have joint access or control for most purposes. What does that mean? Here's an example. You've got a... Um, a piece of property, it's, it's a, uh, a leased property, you've got two roommates that live there, one guy's name is on the lease, they're both paying rent, they both have keys, they both come and go as they please. In that situation, even though only one person is on the lease, either of those roommates can give you consent to inspect that property. Another situation, again, you've got a leased property, two roommates live there, one guy's name is on the lease, He's got his uh, best friend from high school who is, uh, you know, basically freeloading off of him, not paying any rent, but he still has got a key, still comes and goes as he, ple as he pleases. Does that give rise? Does that person have authority to consent? 
The answer is yes. That's a person who has got mutual use of the property for most purposes. He lives there. It's his home as well. So even though he's not paying rent, and even though probably his roommate should kick his butt out, he still can give you consent to come in and perform an inspection. A couple specific scenarios. Wait till that telephone stops right. <laughs> couple specific scenarios that you may encounter. What about a parent? There we go. <laughs> What about a situation where you've got a parent and you've got a child? A parent can generally consent for you to inspect a child's portion of a house. That can apply whether it's a little child or whether it's an adult. So for example, um, there is the case of Commonwealth versus Pinkins. And there what you had, again it's a criminal case but it still applies, there you had an adult child who was living at home with mom and dad, um, happened to have some drugs in his room, police show up. Mom says, yeah, come on in. I'll let you inspect Junior's, or take, take a look around Junior's room. Lo and behold, they find um, the drugs. Um, Junior's then prosecuted and says, hey, that was an unlawful search. Mom didn't have authority to consent to let them come in my room. The court said, I don't know what you're complaining about. Listen, Junior, you lived at home. You do have an expectation of privacy. But you let your mom do all your laundry put your laundry away in your drawers. In fact, she was coming in at least once a week cleaning your room for you. So your mom had mutual use of that room just as much as you did. So either you or mom had the authority to consent to let someone come into that room. Now one that I know um, comes a little closer to you guys, landlord. Can a landlord consent to let you search a tenant's property? The answer to that is, for the most part, no. A landlord cannot give you consent for the tenant. And I'm glad to see people shaking their heads out there. It looks like this is nothing new to you. Um, you know, you, listen, there could be fact situations where the landlord has as much access to the property as the tenant, but for the most part, those are, that's going to be information that's out of your knowledge, something that's out of um, your experience. In those situations where, where you've got a, um, a tenant, you may need to go and, and get a search warrant in order to have a lawful search. However, as I believe you probably know, the landlord could let you perform an inspection of common areas, areas that are open to all of the, the people, as could the tenant. The tenant could let you inspect the common areas and let you inspect their unit. Um, hotel clerk can't let you inspect a hotel room. I don't know how often you inspect hotels here, but um, that's a rule. How about the situation where you've got two people who both have got authority to permit a search, and they're both there, and one person says, come on in and inspect, and the other person says, I'm not letting you in to inspect. What do you do there? That's right, you can't come in. You have to go get a search warrant. Um, basically, their consent cancels each other out. You don't have to ask both of them if one of them's not there, but if they're both there at the same time, one consents and the other one doesn't, you're not allowed in there. Here's an example of a case where um, codes basically went through and got proper consent from all of the important par parties. Gardner versus McGrory. It's a Third Circuit case um, <clears throat> from 2003. Involved the city of Wilkesboro, an apartment building. They get a complaint that this apartment is just a mess, that there's dangerous situation there. Tenant leads the code enforcement officer into the building. They go through an unsecured front door. They walk through the common area to the on-site manager who happens to live in the apartment building. Knocks on the on-site manager's door and says, hey, listen, you know, we've had complaints from this tenant. Um, we want to go do an inspection. On-site manager says, hey, no problem. Grabs their keys. They go around. At, you know, this is not a routine property inspection. They're just showing up. It's complaint driven. They knock on every door where there's someone who's renting the uh, particular units. Each of those tenants in this case happens to give them entrance to inspect their rooms. If there was a locked room that was unrented, the on-site manager voluntarily let codes in to inspect those rooms. They go through and ultimately they inspect the entire building and in each level they were given permission to go in either by the tenant or by the on-site manager. Well, the owner of the building turns around and files a civil rights lawsuit 
and says, you know, this was an unlawful search and seizure, they didn't have consent, the court looked at it and said, no, that's not the case at all. In fact, codes properly got consent from each of the parties they were required to get consent from. The owner said, well, not from me. And he said, well, you know what? The on-site manager had the authority to give your consent, and so then that was okay. And that actually brings me to our next topic, which is apparent authority. Um, well, actually, you know what? We're not quite on apparent authority, but um, these, these topics blend together. This is whether someone other than the owner themselves um, has got the authority to give you consent. And the, the example I just gave you was the on-site manager. The question is, did that person have authority? In, in the last case, the on-site manager lived there, had keys to all of the apartments. Part of their responsibility was taking care of the apartment, so that person did have authority to grant consent on behalf of the owner. And I know here in Reading, you've got um, registered agents. If the um, landlord lives outside of the city, you know that registered agent would have authority to give you consent. Um, <clears throat> Apparent authority, though, sort of melds into this because apparent authority is what happens when you show up and you think that someone has authority to let you search the property, but they really don't. And the answer is, as long as it's a good faith belief that that person has authority, you can rely on what they tell you, but it's an objective standard. They're going to look at all the facts and circumstances that, that confront you at the time. So were you reasonable in believing that the person that let you do the inspection had authority? Um, another example, uh, Spradlin versus the borough of Danville. Property owner owns a lot of properties. He's one of those pain in the neck people who owns a lot of properties. They're all falling down. They get a complaint by one of the um, neighbors that there's some un unauthorized construction going on. Codes agent or codes officer exchanges correspondence, telephone calls with the owner. You know, I want to do an inspection. The owner says, sure, 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 but keeps blowing them off. Finally, she says, listen, I'm doing the inspection on the 12th. Meet me out there at the property. The codes officer shows up out there at the property, and lo and behold, the owner isn't there. Doesn't surprise anybody in the room, does it? The manager of the property, however, it happened to be a gym, the manager is there, and the manager has keys. And the codes officer says, hi, I'm the codes officer from the borough of Danville. And the manager said, hey, you know what? I was expecting you. I knew that there was an inspection today. The landlord told me, come on in. They go through, and that manager takes the, uh, the codes officer through, unlocks all the, uh, the doors. They do the inspection, find a lot of violations. The owner of the property turns around, files a civil rights lawsuit against them, saying that there was no authority for that manager to let them in, let them do the inspection. It was outside of their, uh, their job description. Court said, number one, that's not true. No, this is the manager of the property. This manager had keys. This manager was aware that an inspection was scheduled, and this person voluntarily took the codes officer throughout the building. Therefore, this, the manager had actual authority to consent to this search. I said, but more than that, even if they didn't have actual authority, the codes officer had every reason to believe that they had authority. Codes officer shows up. They said, oh, yeah, you're here for the inspection, knows why she's there, unlocks all the doors for her. So it was reasonable for that codes officer to believe that this was someone who had consent, who had authority to consent to the search. Now, there is one caveat to all of this. You may have an obligation to inquire a little further whether this person really has authority or not. If something doesn't seem right to you, or you know, if it shouldn't seem right to you, the court's gonna say, hey, listen, you might have to ask some, extra que some additional questions to assure yourself this person has authority to consent to let you into the property. So let's go back to our borough of Danville case. You know, you're the codes officer, you show up there, and uh, you're greeted at the door by somebody who looks like they've been wearing their clothes for about two months. They smell of gin, their hair is all over the place. Um, you say, hi, I'm the codes officer. I'm here for the inspection. The person says, all right, come on in. You may have to ask a couple extra questions, such as, are you the manager here? Um, or are you just a homeless person who's living in the doorway? Uh, but but that's the, you get the idea. I mean, the circumstances dictate whether you need to ask additional questions to assure yourself that they have authority to let you in. Let's reverse this one second. Let's say that in these circumstances, 
the landlord actually wants your intervention because let's say he has apartments there earlier went over the landlord may not give you permission into a dwelling unit you know what? I'll tell you what I'd like to do. Let me answer your question at the end of all of this, just in case some of the other things that we talk about may, may answer your okay. question, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. All right, thank you. How's that? Yes. No problem. Um, okay, some other exceptions to search warrants. Um, and I'm going to go over these pretty quickly. Exigent circumstances. You know, warrantless entry uh, may be okay where there's a compelling need for official action and there's no time to get a warrant. Classic example is fire. If your firemen were required to get a search warrant every time they wanted to fight a fire on somebody's property, uh, you know what, the whole city is going to burn down. Um, you know, and applying as far as, as fire is concerned as well, the firemen are allowed to stay on the property for a reasonable amount of time after the fire, basically to make sure that the fire doesn't restart, but also to investigate the cause of the fire because, uh, you know, either unintentionally or intentionally, the evidence of the cause of the fire may disappear. Um, exigent circumstances usually are, are pretty apparent to you. You've got a situation where she's going to blow. You've got an illegal gas connection, and you don't know who the owner of the property is. You don't have the time to find out. Um, that may be an exigent circumstance. My advice to you is if you think you have exigent circumstances, just you know, at least think about it twice. Make sure that it is, in fact, something that you have to act on quickly. Um, because if you have the time, maybe you know the owner of the property, to, to uh, actually try to get in touch with them first. You should go that route, or you should seek a search warrant. But if you truly don't have the time, then you do have the right to go in without a search warrant and, and to uh, do whatever you have to do to secure the property. Um, the more tricky issue is plain view. Now, we talked about plain view a little bit earlier with respect to code violations. And basically, the requirement for plain view is that the violation is in plain view. It's incriminatory a character is immediately apparent. So earlier, when I said you're looking through the slats in the fence, you see a violation. Yeah, I can tell it's a violation from here. I don't have to go in there and inspect it. Um, and that you're lawfully there at the time. So in other words, you're not trespassing in the first place. What I do want to mention, I know that Captain Drexler is probably going to say something about this later, is sort of the interplay between the police department um, and police officers, I should say, because you are part of the police department, police officers and codes. You may be doing these inspections, and you may see evidence of a crime. You may see cocaine marijuana, you, you know, illegal firearms, whatever. You're there doing a codes inspection. You're not there doing a criminal investigation. If you see evidence of a crime, what you need to do is alert the police. What they'll then do is they'll use you as basically their complainant, and they'll use your information to support a search warrant, and that would be part of the affidavit of probable cause. But you should not do anything on your own, either by confiscating the drugs, firearms, or whatever, you should need to bring it to the attention of the police. They need to obtain their own search warrant. All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about search warrants themselves, and Captain Drexler is going to go into a little bit more um, detail about some of this. But administrative search warrants and probable cause. Typically, um, in a criminal case, you've got to have probable cause to base a search warrant. Probable cause is probable cause to believe that a search will reveal evidence of criminal behavior. That's the standard in a criminal case. We're dealing with administrative search warrants, and there's a different standard. In an administrative search warrant, probable cause is met by finding that a reasonable relationship exists between the property maintenance code and the property to be searched. Probable cause is measured in terms of the reasonableness of the search. This is a lower and easier standard to meet than in a, a criminal case. This standard goes back to the 1967 case of Camara versus San Francisco. The United States Supreme Court basically said these property maintenance codes are constitutional and they can give you right to seek an administrative search warrant. And in that case, the US Supreme Court found that reasonableness is the standard, because basically, there's a long history of the public 
and the courts accepting these administrative searches, that administrative search warrants in general are designed to help the public, in, you know, help the entire public um, by abating dangerous situations. Administrative search warrants aren't personal because they're aimed at property rather than at individuals. They're not aimed at gathering criminal evidence. And it's, therefore, it's a limited invasion of privacy. So they lower the standard for probable cause. Now, to get an administrative search warrant, oh, a little far. Seem to be missing. There we go. To get an administrative search warrant, you're going to have to fill out an affidavit of probable cause. And again, this is something um, that I just want to talk to you briefly about. But the rule of thumb is that with an administrative search warrant or any, any affidavit of probable cause, you want to tell the judge all information that you're aware of that's going to help the judge to, to decide whether or not to grant or to deny a search warrant. You basically want to tell them everything that's relevant to why you want to go on the property. It is wrong of you to omit relevant information if you're aware of it. Now, you don't have an obligation to do a complete inspection before you, fi you fill out a, an affidavit of probable cause, but you're going to have to do a reasonable inspection, and you're going to have to bring to the judge's intention everything of which you're aware. And it's important for you to remember that an affidavit of probable cause is sworn testimony. So if you lie in an affidavit of probable cause, you can expose yourself to perjury charges, which carries both criminal or civil liability. So it's something, you know, you got to make sure you're telling the truth in it. Redding's Property Maintenance Code, it's got a definition of reasonable cause in it. And basically, there's five uh, different examples that it gives of probable cause. But by its very nature, it says these aren't the only things that give rise to probable cause. But in your property maintenance code, the five reasons that it states you might have reasonable cause to inspect is, one, the inspection is part of a planned inspection in the part of the city in which the property is located. That might give you probable or reasonable cause. Two. The code enforcement officer, meaning you, has a reason to believe there's a code violation on the property. Three, access to the properties needed to inspect a previous violation. Four, Department of Code Services learn that there's a complaint about a violation on the property. This is sort of in comparison to you hearing about it directly. Or five, access to the property is needed to determine if the property meets standards of property maintenance, building, fire, and or health codes, or for the general um, safety or welfare of the public. As I mentioned, these are not the only reasons for reasonable cause, but these are five examples that are given in your property maintenance code. When you're seeking a search warrant based upon a planned routine inspection, what the port is going to do, as we said a moment ago, they look at basically at the purpose of the ordinance. Your property maintenance code is a um, comprehensive ordinance that's been passed to protect the, for the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And it um, regulates all aspects of, of the building. And then they're going to look to the relationship between your ordinance, the property maintenance code, and the property that you want to search itself. And you're going to want to tell the judge information that sort of ties the two together. So you'll tell them how long has it been since the last inspection? What type of a building it, is it? Is it a uh, private house? Is it a um, multi-unit apartment building? Is it a commercial building? The condition of the entire area. This is in a, in a really run-down part of the city where we've got a lot of problems. Or this is in a part of the city where it's been um, regentrified or something like that. And the, but the one thing that you do have to remember, it, you know, you also want to tell them any other information that you can think of that might tell the judge, hey, I should issue this search warrant. But the important thing for you to remember, you don't have to have specific knowledge that there's a violation in that property to be entitled to get a search warrant, uh, an administrative search warrant, to perform a property maintenance inspection. <clears throat> I'm going to give you another example. Um, this is an example of an area inspection. Basically, uh, the borough of Glen Olden, which is a, a client that I've represented in the past, 
they had a, an apartment building there, 174 unit apartment building. Borough sends out notice, we're gonna do inspections here. Owner then notifies all the tenants, hey, we're doing inspections here. Everybody lets codes in, they go, they do an inspection of the building. One woman decides she doesn't wanna let codes in. She thinks that it's unreasonable that they come into her property. Codes tries to negotiate with her. Finally, they get a search warrant. They go in, inspect her property. It's the end of the story, or so you would think. Civil rights lawsuits filed against them. Unreasonable search and seizure. The judge in Philadelphia looked at this case and said, you know what, I'm looking at this, I don't see a violation of, their, of this woman's civil rights. He said, here you've got a property maintenance code that governs all properties in the borough. This is a property in the borough. Property maintenance code is trying to you know, protect the health, safety, and welfare. Um, here you have a property that hadn't been inspected for a number of years. The, it was reasonable that it's inspected, and so therefore the judge said there's no unreasonable search and seizure. And by the way, in, in that particular case, the owner also said that the uh, search warrant was overbroad because it let them search her entire property. The judge said, that's an absurd argument. This is a property maintenance code. It, it regulates all aspects of the building. Therefore, the search warrant can let you search that entire, perform your inspection on that entire part of the building. How about a warrant based upon a suspected code violation? Somebody comes and tells you that there's a, you, there's a code violation. You can't get consent to enter. What do you do then? Well, again, you're going to want to give the judge sufficient facts to believe that there's a reasonable need for you to enter that property. You want to tell them the code that's going to be enforced. You always want to tell them what law you're enforcing, how long it's been since there's been an inspection, the nature of the building, what type of building it is, the condition of the area, Tell them everything that you know about the complaint that they may have had about the, the building, everything that you're told. Um, any other special conditions that you know, you're gonna to wanna to put that in your affidavit of probable cause. Um, bring it to the judge's attention. Let the judge decide whether or not you've got a reasonable basis to go in and inspect that property. Now, it brings up the last section that I wanna to talk to you about. And, and I save this for the end um, because I think it's appropriate here. It's, the issue of retaliation. What is retaliation? Well, retaliation happens when you have someone who exercises their constitutional rights. Usually it's the First Amendment right. You've got a person who complains that uh, the city of Reading is unfair, code enforcement is unfair, whatever. They're exercising their, their constitutional right to criticize. Then the municipal actor goes and retaliates by doing something um, they take some action against that property owner that would be sufficient to deter a person of ordinary firmness from exercising their constitutional rights. What does that mean? You do something that's bad enough that makes that person say, hey, I'm afraid to speak out anymore. If there's a link between that retaliatory action taken by codes and the person's exercise of their constitutional rights, that's retaliation. Well, that's the definition of retaliation, but how does retaliation play out in the real world? Well, in the real world, it's very easy for somebody to allege retaliation because, you know, everybody exercises their constitutional rights uh, simply by expressing an opinion. We get this a lot in these lawsuits these days because they're, it can be hard to disprove early on in a case. But you really have to have some kind of a, of a link, a causal link between the retaliatory, the retaliatory action and the person expressing their rights. So I come back to what I was telling you earlier about consistency in your enforcement of the codes. If you're consistently enforcing your codes, it's gonna be hard for someone to say that they were singled out and treated differently or treated specially because they've exercised their constitutional rights. Similarly, keeping your cool. If you remain professional and calm, it doesn't give somebody any sort of a hook to claim that your inspection or your citation was retaliatory. And it's also important for you to understand that just because somebody does speak out and maybe somebody does criticize the government or you personally or whatever, doesn't put them above the law. This comes back to uniform enforcement. If you're going to enforce the codes against somebody 
who hasn't spoken out against you, you're going to enforce the codes against somebody who has. You just need to be uniform in your application. So that concludes my discussion of the constitutional issues that face code enforcement officers. I thank you very much for your time. And that will be the end of this program. See, a lot of this has, has already been, been touched. I think maybe what would be a good idea, uh, certainly I've been teaching our academy classes and updates on how to prepare search warrants for many years, but of course my expertise is on the criminal side, so uh, we'll, we'll touch as much as I know about the administrative side. Maybe it'd be a really good idea if you, if you look at the search warrant and if you look at your blank, uh, I thought it'd be neat to kind of go through this a little bit and maybe just kind of fill in with some of your hand notes <clears throat> on what should be uh, filled in. Uh, these are all state forms. These are computerized forms. I know the codes office has everything that we have access to, which includes printing out these forms. So a search warrant can actually be filled out from your computer right in your own office, uh, whoever is going to do the, the search warrants. Uh, so if you look at the top there under affiant name or uh, affiant name, that is nothing more than your own name. It would be codes officer so-and-so. Uh, instead of where it has the Reading Police Department next to it, certainly that would just be the city of Reading codes informant office or whatever. Uh, date of application, of course, would be the day that you're applying for the search warrant. Now, this is all on page one, the application. So it would be your name, the affiant, whoever is obtaining the warrant and who intends to uh, serve it. And of course, the city of Reading would be your address, your phone number, and the date. Now your next block there, it should read identify items to be searched for and seized. Basically what that block means is you want to fill in there what you intend to find. What you, why are you going in there? What do you want to see into that premises? Now, if it would be a criminal case, we'd be looking for drugs or guns or evidence of a crime. With an administrative warrant, you would certainly be looking for evidence of whatever, faulty wiring, evidence of a jumped uh, gas line, circumventing UGI, circumventing meters, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, you could actually even put on there you, that you're, you're photographs, things that you're going to seize. You want to take a photograph of that violation. Anything that you attempt to use as a result of you looking into that property, what do you want to go to a district justice and present, just like you're in a courtroom, any type of evidence? So other than criminal evidence, it would just be evidence of a, a code violation. Certainly could be photos, could be uh, faulty wire, could be pictures of a bad connection. Whatever you are taking, that's what you're searching for. And, you know, it says there be as specific as, as possible, but, you know, certainly you just do your best. A lot of times you're not going to know what's in there. So you're certainly going to come upon stuff that you don't have listed in there that you want to seize. But, you know, word it like in any other violations, things like that. I know there were some problems in the past in the city. Your next square, uh, it should say specific description of premises and or persons to be searched. If you want to keep anything in mind, when you are obtaining a search warrant, you have to understand this is a court order. And I'm going to explain who gives it to you and everything else in a little bit after we do it. But this court order is for one premises and one premises only. If you are going to 531 North Front Street, you would fill in here, it says specific description of premises. You would simply put 531 North Front Street, City of Reading, County of Berks, Pennsylvania. Describe the building, you know, being a two and a half story red brick row type dwelling with white trim, something like that. All you're doing is taking any ammunition away from a defense attorney. How do you know you went to the right place? Yes, sir. No, that building has multiple dwelling units. <laughs> that, that's my next part. Yeah. Part B is if you are going to a separate apartment that is under control of somebody else, you would need a, a separate search warrant. Because what you're doing is, yeah, you're, you're basically 
I don't want to say you're violating somebody's rights, but everybody has their right of privacy. Now, unless that's different with an administrative search warrant, I don't think so. If you have multiple units. Now, do you go in every unit when you search a building? Really yeah. Yeah. I've seen search warrants in the past where they'd have like uh, 234, 236, 238 Cedar Street. No good. I can't imagine a district justice would ever sign that. They're, they're individual warrants because they're under the control of a different person. Now, I would certainly have you uh, or Michelle find out about that if there's any difference, but I can't imagine it's any different. You, you would need separate search. Do you agree with me on that? Uh, I believe that's the case, although uh, an argument could, could be made that where you've got multiple units in there and it's a property maintenance inspection, right. you're there to inspect right. the property as a whole. And, and I, I, I would appreciate if you could look into that because that's tough for me to answer. Certainly one address. Multiple units. In that one address. Right within that one address. Certainly on a criminal search warrant, there's no question that is separate warrants. If we're going to somebody who lives on the first floor, we would say 531 North Front Street, Reading Burks, PA, being a three and a half story red brick with white trim, and then we would also have first floor front apartment, like apartment A, or if it had a, a, a letter on the door. I just don't know if there's anything different. I apologize, but I don't. I don't know if there's anything different for an administrative warrant that would give you the right to search multiple apartments in one building. I would. I, I've never seen the issue addressed one way or another. Okay. Right. For an administrative warrant, I right. certainly have it in a criminal warrant. Oh, yeah, criminal warrant. There's absolutely no question. Uh, if we go to a house where we know they're dealing drugs, let's say there's three separate units, that's three separate search warrants, or we cannot go and. We can't go to another unit. Yep. Your next line where it says name of owner, occupant of premises to be searched, very simply, common sense, that is the person who owns that property. Uh, your next line, violation of, that would strictly be what do you expect to find there? Code violations, it would be in violation of uh, City of Reading codes, number you expect bad wiring, bad water, uh, a jump UGI system, I don't know what you call that, but you know where they're jumping the line, something like that, your expertise is that field. Uh, whatever it be in violation of, whatever code. In, in criminal work, it would be in violation of the Pennsylvania Crimes Code. Uh, certainly administrative warrants, it would be in violation of the city codes as amended whatever year. And if you know a section, fine. You know, be as specific as you can always. Data violations, very simple, you just fill that in I happened to print this yesterday. That's why yesterday's date on there. That just comes up on our computer, uh, whatever day you're executing it. Uh, your next line, uh, you don't have to have anything approved by the district attorney. Number two, additional pages attached. I can't imagine you're going to have any of that. Probable cause affidavit must be attached. The probable cause affidavit uh, we'll get to in just a minute. I know it was just touched, but uh, let's just kind of do this first page. Uh, signature of affiant, you're going to sign that when you appear in front of the district justice who is issuing the search warrant. Right under that, you're going to see the words sworn to and subscribe to me this. If you're getting a search warrant signed, guys, if you're getting it signed at 2 p.m. on February 12th, that would read, sworn to and subscribe before me this 12th day of February 2009. He, DJ would fill in his own magisterial district. Uh, but that would be the date and time. And that's critical when that gets put on there. Because very simply, when you obtain a search warrant, you have exactly 48 hours to, ser to serve that warrant. 48 and a half hours later, that warrant is no good anymore. You must serve it. Uh, within that 48 hour period, but we'll get into that a little bit more when I get into some of the rules of criminal procedure with it. But anyway, the next line can either be filled in by uh, your office or whatever. We usually fill it in ourselves so we know it's correct. Uh, the warrant shall be served as soon as practical and shall be served only between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. There's two types of search warrants. 
the two types, I'm sorry, there's two types of search warrants, what you call a daytime warrant and what you call a nighttime warrant. Unless you people have emergency circumstances, I would safely assume that 99.99% of the time you will be serving what is called a daytime search warrant. So you would cross, uh, put an X in that top square. And what that means is the, the, the courts and court cases have decided, and rightfully so, that between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., they don't want people knocking and barging doors down to do either uh, searches for criminal activity or even searches for uh, code violations and so forth. So the, the, the courts have said search warrants should be served from 6 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. If you find you need one outside of those hours, then you have to put something in here that justifies why do you want to hit something at midnight. If you feel you have a safety violation and maybe you don't have quite enough to go barging in without a search warrant, say, hey guys, we got to do this tonight. We're not going to wait till 6 o'clock. We have somebody's safety. We might have a gas leak, whatever. Then you could go and put a uh, request for a nighttime warrant. It's the only difference. As I said, I cannot imagine uh, any, if, if any times, that you guys will need anything other than square number one there, which says any time between 6 in the morning and 10 o'clock at night. Okay? And then the next line down there where you see PM and o'clock and 2000, that's going to be exactly, it means the search warrant runs out. If you get the search warrant signed at 2 o'clock on February 12th, the date down there will be 2 o'clock February 14th, 2009, which is exactly 48 hours from the time you get it served. Time you get it signed. So anytime you get it signed, you have exactly 48 hours to execute the warrant. The bottom is nothing more than issued under my hand. The DJ will fill that out. He'll put a seal on it and go from there. So really, that's that's kind of page one. There's nothing there other than be as specific as you can. Describe the premises. Make sure you have a good address on there. Uh, if you're looking at first floor apartment, put first floor whatever you have. We described the house to take any bitches from an attorney out. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, they, they play, you know, a criminal attorney will play, see, I cut you out, you know, like that. Uh, you know, they'll look for any faults you have, and that's their job, to protect who they're uh, representing. So we try to be as good as we can. Going on to page two, and, and I know it was, it was covered, probable cause, the way I teach probable cause with a criminal warrant, is what leads you to believe, and this kind of goes with an administrative warrant, what leads you to believe that there's seizable objects in a certain place? And if you think of that, that is my own definition of probable cause. And, uh, you know, to me, there's no difference between criminal and uh, administrative uh, a warrant. Why do you believe there's violations in a house? Now, I'm not talking a normal place that has to be inspected and you have no idea if there's violations, but if you think there's violations in the place, probable cause is nothing more than why do you think it's there? Maybe you were there six months ago, there were violations, they were given six months to correct them, you now have to go in to see if they're corrected, anything like that. You receive complaints from neighbors, you receive complaints from tenants that there's bare wires, that uh, you know there's no hot water in the premises, whatever. Why do you believe you want to get into that location and what do you want to find at that location? No heat, no water, bad wiring, uh, jump uh, system for services, something like that. And why do you believe that violation's there? That's what probable cause is. Why do you believe there's something seizable at a certain location? You know, start from the beginning couple paragraphs should, should do it. When a judge issues a search warrant, there's something in, in, in prior court cases called the four corners rule, and a judge may only look at these four corners of a piece of paper of probable cause, and that's what he bases his decision on, what is uh, good and what isn't. You can't give him oral testimony later, oh uh, yeah, judge, I forgot that, by the way, it has this. 
he can't use any of your oral testimony. Four quarters rule goes back to, my goodness, I think the early 70s, and it has to be what's on this paper. So why do you believe there's certain things in there that you want to seize? That's probable cause. That's my quick definition, and I think it's, it, it's easier than a lot of, you know, the law dictionary, it's probable cause, facts are apparent facts, which would lead a reasonable and prudent person to believe that there is certain criminal, you know, it goes on and on. I like it the easy way. Once you fill out the search warrant, you take it to the district justice. The search warrant then uh, executed. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, there's, there's always three parts to a search warrant. The first page was the application where we filled in. The second part was the probable cause. Why do you believe there's certain things there? And part three is what we call the receipt inventory or return of service. We must list anything that we take. So when you go in and execute that search warrant, you're going to take, if you look at page three here, it'll say County of Berks return of service. You're basically just filling out in date of search, time of search. Sign your name, whoever's uh, doing the search warrant. Underneath that, put another couple of the codes officers or a police officer that's with you, whatever. Uh, just kind of fill that out. And then, of course, page four. That's nothing more than the receipt inventory itself. And the receipt inventory is what are you taking? Are you taking fixtures? Are you taking a piece of bad wiring? Are you taking this? Whatever you're, if you're taking anything out of there, you know, other than taking photographs or whatever. And there you just, again, fill out the date of search, fill out the time of search, you sign your name, and in the bottom of that you'll see two squares that'll say either personally left with or was left at the location. If a person is there and you execute the search warrant, when you are finished, you should give them You'll have extra copies with you. DJ will make about six copies for you. You will give them a copy of the search warrant application. You'll give them a copy of the probable cause affidavit. Why are you there? And you will give them page three, uh, receipt inventory. What did you take from their house? If they are not there, you are to leave it in a conspicuous location, such as put it on a kitchen table, hang it on the refrigerator, whatever. When that person comes home, they don't, oh my God, I've been burglarized. They're gonna say, oh, it was just the city of Reading. They did a codes inspection. That's why my door lock is forced or broken or whatever, if you have to, to force. And I'm not getting into whatever rules the city's gonna have about entry, but uh, certainly you're better off having the person there. You give them all three copies, but they have the right to have those copies right away. Otherwise, you're just going to have their attorney calling you a very short time later. How come I didn't get any copies? And, you know, then you've got to make arrangements to, to meet with them and all that. But uh, constitutionally, of course, they have the right to know why was their Fourth Amendment taken to a point of a search warrant issue. So give it to them or leave it in a conspicuous location when you leave. Uh, needless to say, if you damage a place, uh, you try to shore it up the best you can. You know, we don't go breaking windows just to break the window. Kick it right at the lock, you'd be surprised you could force a lock if you have to make forced entry. If, if, if your department and your supervisors feel that it's uh, uh, important enough to get in there and you do make forced entry, you're kind of up to you to kind of fix it a little bit, put some wood on it, whatever it takes to, uh, to fix it. But again, that's going to be uh, upon the discretion of, uh, I'm sure, your supervisors on entry. Criminal warrants we serve no matter what. We don't care if they're home or not. We're going to either go in or force. So really, that's, that's the search warrant itself. Uh, what you want to consider, there, there are certain rules with search warrants. Uh, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of specifics, but generally the ones that you're going to have to, uh, you're going to, have to know. Uh, when you execute a search warrant, number one, the biggest thing to remember is you have 48 hours. You may go on the 47th hour and 58 minutes. If you get that signed at 2 o'clock, if you get that signed at 2 o'clock on the 12th, and you decide you're going to serve at the 14th at 1.45, you knock on that door, you make entry. Doesn't matter. You can, you can be searching there for hours on end. 
It does not run out in 48 hours. Your time of entry must be within 48 hours. You must execute the warrant within 48 hours. So if 47 hours and 50 minutes goes by and you're saying, holy Christ, I only got 10 minutes, as long as you make a proper entry into that house, you may stay there as long as you can. We have a homicide scene. We do a search warrant almost every one. We'll keep that scene for three days till we have an autopsy. Uh, as long as we execute it, we maintain control of that house, you may go over that 48 hours. That makes sense. It's entry upon 48 hour time. Once you uh, have the search warrant, you go and make entry, you have, I'm sorry, I'm not used to a camera, I have a habit of moving. You have certain rules other than the 48 hours. Anytime you make entry into a premises, Rules say you must do two things, and that is called knock and announce. You must knock and you must announce. <clears throat> Even if you have a homeowner. I lost one case in suppression in my whole career serving a search warrant, and it's because I failed to knock and announce, and I had the homeowner standing next to me telling me there was nobody else home. Go to the door. When you are ready to make entry, whether you have a key, whether the person is... Uh, Opening the door for you, practices, knock as loud as you can. Reading codes officer, city of Reading, we're executing a search warrant. That's the rules of criminal procedure. And it's for your own safety, especially the police going into a criminal warrant. We yell it a hundred times. But you must knock and announce. And that is for the privacy of people in the house. You might have somebody else in there, uh, you know, and they're not dressed or they're in a bit, whatever. You have to have them time. Once you knock, and announce uh, court decisions say you must wait a reasonable amount of time before you make entry. What's a reasonable amount of time? There's probably 20 cases that will give you 20 opinions. I would say if you go at least a minute or two to be safe, you make about three announcements. If at that point you get no response and it's your uh, supervisor's idea, we're gonna serve this search warrant one way or the other, then you may make forcible entry. But remember, before you make forcible entry, or if somebody opens the door for you, you will do the same thing and you will knock and announce. Uh, writing codes, we have a search warrant. So you get your warrant, 48 hours to execute it. You go there, you knock and announce before your presence. You execute the warrant. You take what you want to take. You fill out a receipt inventory and give them a copy of all three parts of the search warrant probable cause application or affidavit, your uh, application is page one and receipt inventory page three. Those three they get. Now, if you have a search warrant, whether you served it or not, you must take that original back to the district justice, wherever you got it signed. The district justice, you must return it within 10 days. If he signs or she signs a search warrant, even if you don't execute it for some reason, 10 days procedure says you must take the search warrant back whether it's executed or not, because it is a court record already. So 10 days you have to get the uh, search warrant back. Usually you're gonna do it the next day, you know, when you have time. Uh, who may serve, who may uh, issue a search warrant? Real simple, Pennsylvania, if you think of Reading or Berks County, you have two types of districts. You have a managerial district and you have a judicial district. We happen to be judicial district 23. We have district justices in Wernersville, Birdsboro, Hamburg, uh, Ole, five in Reading. Any district justice in Berks County, which is our judicial district, any district justice may give you a, certain, a search warrant for any magisterial district. So if you're looking to get a search warrant across from Wally Scott's office and he happens to be closed, it's four o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, uh, you can go anywhere to get that search warrant signed, anywhere. Uh, at nighttime or after four o'clock if DJs are closed, you simply go down to the courthouse, there's an on-call DJ and he can serve it because he is within our district, whoever's, uh, it's usually a senior district justice, but any magistrate, may issue a search warrant for anywhere under Judicial District 23, which of course is Berks County. So don't think, oh shit, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the district justice isn't available. I can't get a search warrant signed. That is not correct. Anybody in? in DJs like to serve their own paperwork. You know, they like to issue their own search warrant. So our rule of thumb, if that search warrant is ready to be signed and that district justice in that area is available, we go to him first. But you may certainly go to, uh, to anybody. Okay? Anybody within the district. I know I've done a lot of talking. Any, uh, any questions as far as execution? I know you have a uh, parameters or guidelines set up about having people there. I can't emphasize how important it is, too. Uh, I know he had touched it just a little bit. If you see controlled substances, please just stop there. Guard the room. Don't let anybody in. You're fine. But give us a call. And uh, the famous case, uh, which was a Pennsylvania Superior Court case, happened to be mine, uh, Adolph Black. Uh, Commonwealth versus Black. We actually went into a second story lounge down there in Franklin Street. Uh, we went in with LCE, that was LCB back then. We went in with liquor control, uh, executed uh, their search warrant, found all kinds of cocaine behind the bar, and uh, went all the way to Superior Court and we lost it all. So that's one of the uh, cases uh, that are still cited all the time. Uh, if you see something on a search warrant, Police just can't go barging in with you, uh, hopefully to get a free peek because, hey, I know you're doing a property inspection. I know that guy's dealing cocaine or drugs. We can't ride your coat deals. So if you see something, you call us. Our vice guys will come right out, do a quick search warrant based on what you saw, and we'll go in there and seize it and make a good seizure. And there's many, many court cases that uh, have ruled that way. Adolf Black being one of the most uh, prominent, at least in Pennsylvania. Any questions? Anything you think I missed? I mean, I could spend 24 hours going over search warrants, but. I, I think you hit the search warrants. Do you guys have anybody have any questions? Or? Really not that hard, gang. You know, fill in the blanks. And And I wish I could give you the answer. Maybe I should have researched that. Certainly in criminal law, it's a separate search warrant for each unit. But I would ask you or Michelle to look that up for you and, and answer that. For instance, the individual dwelling unit is their own privacy as far as space. The landlord can't let you in there. We've covered that already. So even though it's but his building. The, the, that's something we'll look into. Because I, there, there are arguments both for why you might be able to include them all right. in one arguments for why you might not be able to. As I mentioned earlier, I haven't seen any cases one way or another, but I haven't looked into the issue either. Did you want to go over the, uh, uh, the directive that came down? So yeah. every, for everything, so everything we discussed so far also pertains to the wall building codes also. Yeah, and anything we've, the state has, we've adopted from the state the, the criminal law, you know, most of these cases, I've got a copy of the For like safety codes, if you will. The state of Pennsylvania has adopted the ISO as the building codes. Yes. Some like safety codes. The one that says in most cases the property owner will have been notified. Again, you know, when you're doing your administrative warrants, I would assume absolute vast majority will be with the homeowner there. You're certainly going to have that one homeowner who's going to refuse to cooperate with you. Uh, and they're not going to open the door, and I know that was just not too long ago, that one case. Uh, but they'll be notified, and if they don't want to open the door, number two, a search warrant will be reviewed and approved by a police supervisor. Uh, certainly if, if uh, somebody's doing that out of Michelle's office, or if it's going to be out of your office, whatever it might be, just simply uh, give any of us a call. Just come down to criminal investigations, come down to VICE. And we'll certainly look at it and say, hey, that looks good. I've done that with uh, uh, Michelle in the past. In fact, I made sure she, I gave her access to this program to print them up. And uh, whoever's making it up, be more than happy. Anybody in my office can look at it and say, hey, put this in or, you know, whatever. So uh, simply come down to criminal investigations and or advice and we'll be more than happy. When necessary to secure a search warrant, an attempt will be made to notify the owner of the date and time 
I saw I said they're going to be trying to be notified by the city of Reading. I, if I were you guys in every power that I would have, I would make sure that person's there and you make a peaceful entry. You know, well, that's certainly our job is to try to make things as easy as uh, as we can. Because you get a lot of times too, you have a property owner that's giving you trouble, but it's your tenants inside that sometimes has to pay for you know the actions that occur there. So I think it's important for us to take every possible step we can and basically really uh, explain to them why we're there if they don't already know. Explain to them before we make entry and uh, make it as peaceful as we can. I mean, unless you have somebody inside screaming for help or you know somebody being killed or whatever, uh, I don't really think there's any need to, to do anything with haste and to take any uh, steps that uh, you can kind of just take your time and do it the easy way. There's always an easy way of doing it. If the property owner or his representative is uh, present, the codes officer will inform him of the search warrant. Gee, I'm sorry, I just said that really. Purpose and scope of the warrant. Again, I just said that. I didn't even know it was there. Uh, codes officer will request entry into the premises. If denied, the codes officer will again explain their authority and ask for non-force entry. The codes officer will tell the owner that forcible entry will be made if cooperation is not given. Certainly, we are covered under that. Again, it is a, a search warrant is nothing more than a court order. And what that is, that court order directs you to search those premises. That's what a search warrant is. It's a court order that directs you. And once you execute, you're, you're, you're taking over that house. Uh, you're the king of the house at that time. Uh, we don't allow anybody to walk around. Uh, codes violations might be a little different, but I don't want somebody reaching in or, or slamming doors on us, you know. Once you execute a search warrant, you are boss of that house because the court order is telling you that you shall, not may, you shall go in there and search that house. So can you be as absolutely as courteous as you can? And in most occasions, that homeowner is going to be with you and cooperate fully. You know, you have the right to tell them that we shall make entry. Why don't we do it the easy way? And most times you'll get full cooperation, I'm sure. If cooperation is not given, forcible entry will be made using the means and safety precautions deemed prudent. Trying to mitigate damage when possible, certainly I already mentioned that, police officers will make the forcible entry and secure the premises for safety purposes. So we shall go in, we will not conduct a search, we'll go in there, make sure there's nobody in there that can hurt us or you or present any type of ambush situation. Once we deem it to be safe, we will leave and let you people do your job once uh, entry is made, okay? And we're certainly, as police, going to take the exact steps you will. We will make every uh, effort to have somebody there to make a peaceful entry first. If the owner is not present, the code officer serving a search warrant will knock and announce their purpose. After attempting to alert someone inside the building and open the door and admit, the codes officer can make a forcible entry. So very short, what that's telling you is what I explained, rules of criminal procedure, you must knock and announce before you make entry. And the last part here, a copy of the warrant should be handed over to the owner or left inside. And I already covered that. Hand it right to them, all three parts of your search warrant, and then hand over the, uh, uh, if they're not there, hang it on a conspicuous location, put it on a dining room table, something like that. Okay. Excellent. I think that covers everything. Any questions? Didn't want to try to be too technical. Good. Okay, basically just going to go over some of the um, the uh, ins and outs of uh, issuing, actually issuing or filling out the citation. It's pretty self-explanatory. I'm sure you guys have, uh, have done it or have seen a citation. Um, the, a couple of things that I could, points of interest, or things that I can give you. Um, be very specific um, with, uh, and as detailed as you can be, with um, names, uh, exact addresses, dates of birth, social security numbers, those things, so that they don't get um, confused with other people. Uh, many times these citations are going to go to warrants and, uh, and then they'll be picking up the wrong people or, uh, or not verifying. When they have the correct guy, they won't be able to verify because they might not have a middle name or they might not have the second part of his last name. 
something along those lines. So um, be as specific as you can. Social security number always helps. Um, when you're filling these out, large block print uh, would be recommended instead of uh, cursive or uh, you know writing it like you would write a letter. Um, if you tend to do large block print, it's a lot easier for the secretaries and the judges to be able to see and actually understand what it is that you're writing. Um, like I said, it's pretty self-explanatory. The, the first block there about magisterial district number, um, you should all probably have a map that divides the city into six DJs. Um, they are very um, serious about those dividing lines. I'm sure you know, um, but uh, if, if you're uh, you know, not in the center of Center Avenue and you're on one side or the other, you gotta make sure you're on either Hall's side or Lakina's side. And uh, regardless of the fact that the rules of criminal procedure say you can go 100, uh, 100 yards in either direction, um, they want only their citations. So make sure you have your map and you pick the correct DJ. Um, make sure you check, you're filling in the correct section as far as which codified ordinance it is that they're violating. Most of them are going to be sliding fines, so you won't need to be putting in the fines. Uh, the DJ will, uh, uh, will ass assign those. Um, date and time, uh, location, etc. cetera. Uh, our county code is uh, 06, our city code is 301. Um, your station address, et cetera. Um, put a pretty, uh, you know, you have a little bit of a space there for a narrative where you can describe what the offense is and what was uh, violated. And you can also go down into the lower portion if you have to, um, write down anybody that needs to be subpoenaed for court time. And, um, you know, make sure that the addresses and stuff are there for anybody that needs to be subpoenaed so that they can uh, show up and testify. That's pretty much all I have um, as far as the citations go. Uh, you know, it's like I said, it's pretty self-explanatory. Make sure you just fill everything out that you can. Um, you know, try try to eliminate any mistakes if possible. So basically, you want it to be legible. And you want it to include as much information as possible. Correct. Yeah, I mean, the the big thing is legible, um, accuracy with names and addresses as best as possible. Um, another thing, a lot of, uh, I don't know if you'll have it as much as we do, but people like to write citations out to John Doe because they're not sure who the person is. Well, it's a lot easier to put in who you think the person is, a.k.a. John Doe, than John Doe, a.k.a. Steve Smith or whoever the, the right name is. Um, because then it's going to be filed under the person's name who you think it might be, and there's a better chance of that person getting arrested than the, the, the 40,000 John Does that there are out there for um, citations that don't have the correct name. I don't know that you'll have a lot of that going on, but... And most of these citations they'll be writing will be directed towards a property, so they may not know a social security number or somebody. That's not essential, is it? No, it, it certainly won't void the, uh, void the citation, or it's not a, 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 um, a large error, if you will, um, that would make the citation, um, you know, uh, invalid. Um, but the more information, the better. So, I mean, those, some of those things can be obtained um, you know, through different records, property records uh, sometimes, but if you don't have it, obviously uh, you, you can't put it on a citation. Um, the, you know, as much information as you have available is basically all that you can do. And that concludes the, the training program. If any of you have any further questions, I'll advise you, you can talk to either your supervisor, you can talk to the solicitor's office, and I certainly am always happy to answer any questions that you may have as well. Thank you.